In this video, we're going to go over some of the proofs um, that uh, were on homework two, and I wanted to give you some um, archive of the kinds of arguments that we're doing and try to explain how you know how to structure a proof. Um, so let's start with the fact that we proved in class. Um, this is at the intersection of two open sets is open. <clears throat> so this is supposed to be true for any two open sets, and so our proof starts by inviting the person reading our proof to think of any open sets that they would like. And now I'm supposed to show that the intersection of these two sets is also open. And so I know that my proof should end with the statement, therefore, the intersection of T1 and T2 is open. Now the way I'm going to be able to make that conclusion is going to be based on the definition of open. The definition of open just draw a little bracket here. So this bracket signifies <coughs> excuse me, the argument I need to make in order to um, be able to conclude at the end. Oh, shoot. I erased it. Okay. Um, in order to be able to include at the end, conclude at the end that T1 intersect T2 is open. So the definition of open set is that every point in the set is an interior point. So since that's a statement about every point in the set, the structure of the proof would start with give me any point in the set. So I invite my reader to pick any point in the set and I would like to argue that, <coughs> that x naught is an interior point. Let me just write. It's a little challenging to Make everything small enough on here, is in the interior of T1 intersect T2. Okay, so being in the interior um, means that, that we should be able to find a neighborhood um, around X naught that's completely contained inside of T1 intersect T2. That's what being in the interior means. So X naught is in the interior of a set if there's a neighborhood around x naught that's completely contained inside the set. So I need to find um, an x naught. So I'm not going to let the reader pick an arbitrary x naught. I, I have to be able to supply the x naught. And now I realize that um, I have to use my hypotheses because I really have nothing else to go on. So the fact that x naught is in T1 and T2 means, of course, that x naught is in T1 and also x naught is in T2. Um, what I know <coughs> about T1 and T2 is that they're open, and so um, since X0 is in T1 and T1 is open, that means that um, X0 is interior to T1. So there's an epsilon, let's call it epsilon 1, such that the this neighborhood, X0, minus epsilon 1, comma, x naught plus epsilon 1. So the open neighborhood centered at x naught set, uh, with radius epsilon 1 is completely contained in T1. Okay, So that's because T1 is open. Uh, but also T2 is open. So the same thing goes for T2. So there's a neighborhood There's an epsilon, there's a um, neighborhood around X naught that's completely contained in T2. <coughs> now, if you're a set and you're completely contained in T1 and completely contained in T2, then you're completely contained in the intersection. And so you can start to see how I'm going to get to my conclusion that x naught should be an interior point in T1 and T2. I start to see how there might be a neighborhood of x naught that I can argue is in the intersection. But these two guys aren't the same neighborhood. This, this neighborhood and this neighborhood aren't the same thing. If they were the same, then I would know that that neighborhood is in the intersection because it's a subset of both. But these aren't necessarily the same. But they're both neighborhoods of x naught. So think about um, what a number line would look like. If you had x naught and you have one neighborhood 
of X naught, and then you have another neighborhood of X naught, those two neighborhoods have to be nested. One of them is going to be contained within the other one. And so whichever one is, is contained inside the other one, that one is both contained in T1 and contained in T2. And so how do I say, take the one that's contained in the other one? I will say, just let epsilon be the smaller. So we say the minimum of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So that means that the neighborhood x minus epsilon, x naught plus epsilon, is the smaller of these two neighborhoods that I had up here. And so in particular, um, that is going to be a subset of T1 and that same neighborhood is going to be a subset of T2. And so therefore, x naught minus epsilon, x naught plus epsilon is a subset of T1 intersect T2. And now my proof is complete. The next sentence actually makes sense. Thus, x naught is in the interior. We found a neighborhood around x naught that's completely contained inside of here. So that means x naught is an interior point for this. X naught was just any point at all from T1 intersect T2. So that means that every point in T1 intersect T2 is an interior point, And that's what it means for the intersection to be open. OK, so now let's see um, how <clears throat> that allows us to prove the first claim that was on the homework. Here we're trying to prove the union of two closed sets is closed, and so we'll play the same game. Um, I am allowing any two closed sets to be chosen by the reader. I want my conclusion to be um, that the union is closed. And so I want to think about how, what proof strategy I would need to, to do that. Now, the, the union being closed, <coughs> set being closed, um, can be characterized a number of different ways. The definition of being closed is just that the complement is open. So if my next to the last line here is S1 union S2 complement is open, then my last line, that the union is closed, makes sense. Um, the reason for thinking about it in terms of open sets is <clears throat> realize that... Um, That S1 union S2 complement, according to De Morgan's laws, is just the complement of S1 intersect the complement of S2. So the reason that's significant, um, as we work our way back up, um, the reason that's significant is because we know S1 and S2 are closed, we know this set and this set are open. right? That's what closed means. Closed means your complement is open. So here I have the intersection of two open sets. Well, the reason that I'm appealing to this other proof up here is because this other fact shows us that the intersection of open sets is open. <clears throat> um, and so, <clears throat> so now I can see how the proof actually goes together. Um, this is open by the fact that I proved up there, the thing that we proved in class. So I'll just say by the fact <clears throat> that's above there. So the intersection of two open sets is open. So all i got to do is, is put my argument together to, um, to point out to the reader um, why these two components are, are open. And so now um, there's not a whole lot to add here. This means <clears throat> S1 complement and S2 complement are open. Right? That's what it means for the two sets to be closed, the other complements are open. Um, and then there really aren't any other lines. It's really just this. The union <coughs> of the, the complement of the union is the intersection of the complements. But if these two guys are open, then the intersection is open by the fact. And so now I know that um, S1 union S2 complement is open. And so S1 union S2 is closed. So there's not, <coughs> there's no additional um, steps that we have to have in there. Um, this is pretty much how they proved um, in the textbook. We, they originally proved that <coughs> the union of open sets is open and the intersection of closed sets is closed. Their proof of about the intersection of closed sets being closed was exactly like this. They're using the fact that they just proved 
um, the corresponding fact for um, for open sets. And then when you have the fact about closed sets, you can just restate it in terms of open sets. The, um, the characterization of closed that says that a set's closed if it contains all its limit points, that's a little trickier to work with because you have to make an argument that um, taking the union of two sets does not create any new limit points, that the only limit points in the union of two sets are points that would have been limit points for one set or the other. Um, that's not, I mean, that is true, but, um, but it's a little bit subtle to make that argument. Um, if you try to argue that way, um, go back and look at your proof and, um, and ask yourself why it, what, what was special about having just two sets. Because remember, the, um, the, the union of infinitely many closed sets is not necessarily closed. You, you, you did that as an example. So if in your proof there's no place where the fact that there were just two sets seems important, then your proof structure applies to the union of any number of closed sets, and we know that the result is false if you're allowed to have any number of closed sets. So think about how your proof addresses um, the fact that the number of sets that you're taking the union of is just two instead of possibly countably many. That is significant, and that's, the, that's why it's sort of subtle to, to be able to argue in terms of limit points.